For RCR Wireless News, I'm Sean Kinney. We're here at IEEE Globecom in Austin, Texas, joined by Dr. Alicia Abella. She's AT&T's Assistant Vice President of Cloud Technologies and Services Research Organization. Alicia, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. I, first, I want to ask you, I know AT&T is in the process of transitioning to become a fully cloud-based enterprise. Can you tell us a little bit about what's been done to support that transition so far, what's coming up next, and uh, what some of the challenges are to that process? Okay, sure. Um, so, let me first begin with the motivation for doing it. Sure. Um, so, because that was really at the core of why we decided to make this big transformation. So it's not, it's certainly a complex undertaking, and so we decided that it would be important to move into the software-defined networking and cloud environment because we were, having to depend too much on customized hardware that was very expensive, both to purchase and to maintain and to configure and to update. Mm -hmm. um, not only was it expensive, but it was also time consuming. So it meant that we would go, you know, our time to market would be less. Mm -hmm. uh, it would take a long time. It would take more manpower. But with the cloud technologies, there is this promise of being able to do all this, be able to do service deployment quickly, and to be able to also uh, configure and maintain all these services and applications much more readily, mm -hmm. and without the cost of these customized hardware, because what we're using now is commodity hardware, right. cheap off-the-shelf hardware, that we can just configure very quickly and have our applications and services running on them. Mm -hmm. Now you asked me about the challenges that that faces. Sure. So one of the aspects of moving into this cloud environment in order to really get the cost efficiencies that we want and that is promised by cloud, we need to be able to um, take multiple services and applications and run them at the same time on that same hardware, mm -hmm. on that commodity hardware. What that means is that now we have to make sure that we can, using innovative techniques that we're developing in the research lab, be able to do performance isolation, make sure that the services aren't going to interfere with one another, mm -hmm. make sure that we can still guarantee the kinds of quality of service that our customers are used to having, mm -hmm. and also make sure that we protect the data associated with these services. So a lot of the challenges come in with regards to security, mm -hmm. data protection, and then quality of service requirements that we need to meet. Mm -hmm. And so now that the transition is underway, what are some of the benchmarks that are coming up in, in 2015, 2016 before it's a fully a cloud-based operation? So as you would imagine, we're not going to suddenly just, it, it's not one of these things that just happens one day that you just flip the switch and now suddenly all our network is SDN based. Mm -hmm. So a lot of this transformation is happening in baby steps. So we have, as you would imagine, we still have uh, dependency on vendor solutions that will still have to be there because we, we are taking these baby steps of transformation and cloud technology is still relatively new, it's still maturing mm -hmm. and so we need to move uh, very very carefully and so we're moving uh, services and applications in um, I would say in small chunks mm -hmm. into the cloud so we have an, an effort that is looking at open source mm -hmm. as a cloud platform, OpenStack is the one that we're using mm -hmm. And we're looking at that as and slowly building out services on that platform. Mm -hmm. And as it matures, and as we feel comfortable with it and with the technology, we will add more to it and hopefully begin to migrate some of the other applications and services away from the more expensive platforms onto this. As we feel comfortable with all of the requirements I told you about, right? Being able to secure the data, be able to meet the quality of service requirements and all of that. And Alicia, in, in addition to cloud computing, I know you have uh, expertise in uh, Internet of Things, IoT, something that we heard about just this morning in the keynote address at IEEE Globecom. Can you tell me what you see moving into 2015 as sort of the next big trend lines in IoT? Let's see, so if I look at it from the perspective of cloud, mm -hmm. then I would have to say that for us as a company, we're looking very closely at how we can provide, use the cloud technologies to provide better services and better reliability for um, our connected car mm -hmm. offerings. Uh, the connected car is, in a sense, another device. It's like, sure. a, right, it's like, a, like a phone on wheels, if you will, mm -hmm. but it's another one of these devices that 
Um, it's big, but it's not so different than some of these other devices that we're seeing as part of the Internet of Things. And so we're looking at that particular domain mm -hmm. uh, to be able to deliver some of the, the, meet some of the challenges really of the connected car. What does sure. it mean to have all these cars connected, talking to each other, potentially talking to infrastructure, mm -hmm. talking to billboards, talking to bicyclists. Mm -hmm. Um, that's one aspect. And then there's also, for our business solution side, we're also looking at what does it mean when suddenly you're moving from all these little devices and this model of just client-server, but lots of these, millions of these devices all trying to connect up to one place. And what are the challenges that that's going to bring to cloud? And I think what we're seeing is that we're going to have to move a lot of our cloud technologies onto the edge of our network. Right. Right, and that's really the challenge. And how does how is that going to look? There are lots of people looking at that now. Mm -hmm. um, from a network provider perspective, that's how we're trying to think about the problem. What happens when you move some of this technology to the edge? Mm -hmm. What do you have to deal with then? And this is something that we're actually going to look at in 2015. Very good. And uh, you know, you mentioned the the customer and and the client and what AT and T's transition to cloud does for them. Uh, tell me what it does internally. Uh, surely it's got to really let you harness data analytics in a way that you couldn't previously. Yes. So data analytics for one, but it's um, for us internally. We're also looking at doing network function virtualization. Mm -hmm. So a lot of our network functions, we're also looking to move into the cloud. And I'm glad you asked that question because. That really does bring uh, different requirements than your more traditional cloud providers mm -hmm. are used to. So the traditional cloud providers are used to you know, offering web services, emails, uh, sort of traditional IT functions. But as a network provider, we have to deliver services that require you know, high network bandwidth, low latency. So we're looking at a cloud model that needs to connect data centers mm -hmm. Very, very, very tightly, and with a lot of network bandwidth and low latency across multiple data centers. So what does that look like? When you have all these multiple data centers, and you have to orchestrate all these services and network functions that that have these strict requirements that a lot of these traditional cloud provider services don't have. So you have a voice call, for example. You don't want to have that voice call be nothing but perfect and flawless. But if you can only be able to deliver that kind of quality if you have high network bandwidth and you have that so that you don't drop packets, so that your voice doesn't sound choppy when you're talking to someone. And so that's the kind of thing that I mean by, you know, we as a network provider, when we start moving our network functions into the cloud, we have these stricter requirements. And if we could change gears for a moment, Alicia, I know that you do a lot of work uh, promoting science, technology, engineering, mathematics, education for women and minorities. Uh, even won the Columbia University uh, Medal of Excellence, I believe. So can you tell me just a little bit about, from your point of view, what the access challenges to that type of education are for women and minorities and what we can collectively do to uh, make sure that that access is there going forward? Yes, that's a, that's a great question. And um, there's so many activities right now that are going on uh, to try and increase the women participation in STEM fields. Mm -hmm. And it's it's disappointing to see that there aren't more, right? even in this conference mm -hmm. today, right? Um, I'm sure you've seen this. I've noticed the same yeah. thing, yeah. And so I think uh, uh, the, there are so many challenges, but I think the biggest one are uh, lack of role models. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the time, whether it's girls or boys, they need role models, they need somebody to look up to. But in this field mm -hmm. in particular, if there were more women role models that the young girls could look up to, then they could say to themselves, well, you know, she could do it, so could I. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, being able to put more women in positions where they could be role models mm -hmm. is important to try and give more girls that accessibility. Um, the other one is really um, being able to provide programs that will expose girls to what it means to be a scientist and an engineer, mm -hmm. because quite often the, the media might even portray them as the scientists and engineers would be kind of geeky, nerdy. Sure. They don't know how being an engineer can affect the lives of millions of people. And I think if more girls understood that, mm -hmm. they would maybe even go away from some of the more traditional careers that, that do that, that play into that desire of girls to want to help society, mm -hmm. and realize that they could really do that if they became an engineer. And I think they also have to be not afraid of going into engineering. They might think that, oh, but it's mad and it's hard. Mm -hmm. But they can do it because we have the data to prove that in grammar school, middle school, even up until high school, quite often they perform better in math and science than the boys do. Mm -hmm. 
So I think they need encouragement, they need a confidence builder, they need role models, and programs that can give them accessibility to professionals who are doing it, to expose them to what they can do with that kind of degree. Excellent. Well, Dr. Alicia Bella, I certainly appreciate you taking a moment to speak with us here at IEEE Globecom. Thank you so much. Appreciate it, Sean. Thank you.